Good day, hello everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. I hope you are all um, staying well and, and healthy. Uh, I am Pascaline Dupas, the faculty director of the King Center and a professor uh, in the Department of Economics here at Stanford. I will be moderating this special event on COVID-19 uh, in Africa. The event is hosted by the Stanford King Center on Global Development and the Stanford Center for Innovation in Global Health. So let me start with just a few uh, points about what these two centers uh, do. Uh, the King Center is dedicated to stimulating research to elevate global poverty and inform uh, policy on critical development issues. We do that by supporting faculty research, supporting students' opportunities. And over the past four months, we have been uh, hosting a series of webinars on the impact of COVID. We had one on China, one on India, one on Latin America, and this is the fourth one uh, on Africa. Uh, the other center co-hosting in the center uh, for Innovation in Global Health, which is essentially the hub at Stanford for all things global health. It's led by Senior Associate Dean uh, Michelle Berry. Uh, it has three uh, strategic areas, human and planetary health, 21st century leadership, and global health equity. And in this uh, era uh, of COVID, it has been uh, uh, very uh, active and in particular um, sharing a, a newsletter series and also a series of webinars uh, and educational offerings related to COVID-19, um, as well as seed funding for COVID-19 research. So today we are here to discuss uh, the impact of COVID-19 in uh, the Africa region, and we have a fantastic panel uh, to do that. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome uh, our three panelists. Let me introduce them briefly. Uh, you can see their pictures uh, on the slide, but you can also see them uh, <laughs> semi-live uh, on the Zoom. Uh, um, uh, little videos. We have in alphabetical order, uh, Professor Belinda Archibong from Barnard College at Columbia University. Uh, Professor Archibong um, teaches economics and she uh, studies a broad range of issues uh, from gender gap to the environment uh, with a focus on the Africa region. And she's here today because she has uh, done um, a lot of work on epidemics. And so she will share with us uh, some lessons uh, with us from our work on past epidemics in the Africa region. Uh, we also have our Professor Agnes uh, Binaguao. Uh, Professor Binaguao joins us from Kigali in Rwanda. Uh, she's a pediatrician by training. Uh, she's currently the Vice Chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity, and she was formerly uh, the Minister of Health in Rwanda. Uh, as I mentioned, she joins from Kigali, where it's already late in the evening, so we're extremely grateful that she has agreed to be with us uh, today, I should say, uh, tonight. Uh, and our third eminent panelist uh, is uh, Dr. Albert Zoifat from the World Bank. He is the chief economist for the Africa region at the World Bank and has been in this position for uh, quite a while. Uh, he's been at the World Bank uh, for 23 years. He's a macroeconomist by training. Uh, and I suspect that he has spent a number uh, of sleepless nights uh, over the past six months paying very close attention uh, to the economic impacts of the COVID crisis uh, on the continent and thinking about what the World Bank uh, and others and governments can do and should do uh, in response. And so we are eager to hear from him today. So I'm really thrilled uh, to have all of you on the panel. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to be with us. I know it's very, very busy for everyone. Um, and uh, it's really wonderful to be able to hear your insights. Um, here's how we're gonna proceed. Uh, I'll give a few introductory remarks. Uh, then each panelist will have five to 10 minutes to present. And after that, we'll start the Q&A, um, which I will moderate. In way of introduction, let me just start by reminding everyone that uh, Africa is a very large continent. <laughs> Uh, it's the second largest uh, in the world. It covers 20% uh, of the land area of our planet and hosts 16% of the world population. That's uh, just about 1.3 billion people. Uh, it's also, it is also the continent with the largest number of different uh, countries, 54 sovereign entities, uh, with a lot of you know, historical um, and cultural differences. So you know, this is really a huge task that has befallen us on this panel because we have only one hour to talk about the impact of a huge crisis on a huge continent. So uh, in advance, uh, we apologize if we don't do justice to you know, all of the issues that need to be discussed, but we're gonna try to give it uh, our best shots. Uh, and uh, let me start with actually some good news, if I may say. 
the good news uh, is that uh, Africa has mostly uh, beat COVID because this map shows you uh, the total confirmed COVID-19 deaths per million people uh, as of just uh, you know a, a few days ago. And clearly you see that the African continent stands out as being very light uh, in a sense that had very fewer deaths than uh, the rest of the world. The one country uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa that has been uh, the most affected is uh, South Africa. And so this has been coined uh, the Africa puzzle. Um, why are the African continents uh, being mostly spared uh, by, by the crisis? Um, and you know, some folks have been saying, well, this is just undercounting. Actually, the continent is not doing that well. It is that it's not well monitored. Uh, I think that that's something we can like maybe dismiss to some extent, and I'm sure that uh, Professor Benagua will uh, tell us more about that. Uh, but it seems to me that there's no evidence of, uh, you know, massive excess mortality or hospitals overflowing. So I think it's not, it's not, it's not an undercounting issue. Uh, it's really more, uh, more that there has not been uh, as much uh, uh, health um, problems from the from the crisis. So. Then another potential explanation would be biological. Some people have said, well, the, con the continent is much younger. Uh, and you can see this from these uh, visuals. The median age of the population is 18 uh, on the African continent compared to 35 in North America, or even older than that in Europe. And so a younger population, even if they are infected, may be dying at much uh, lower rates. Uh, others have argued that there may be some form of immunity um, stemming from uh, prior exposures to other coronaviruses, or maybe uh, the fact that the body has to deal with malaria on a regular basis, and that may prepare people uh, to, to COVID. Another possible explanation is that uh, Africa did not get uh, exposed to the virus uh, uh, as much initially. There are fewer international travelers coming uh, in uh, Africa. This uh, graph shows you uh, essentially the, the, the share of the world uh, traffic. Uh, and you can see Africa is a very small part of it. And so maybe by the time the international community realized there was really a problem, uh, the actual stock of uh, people infected with the virus in Africa may have been very, uh, very low. And so that meant that uh, the uh, rapid response was uh, especially effective. And in fact, that may be, you know, the most likely, uh, you know, um, explanation for why Africa has been doing so well, which is that it actually had a very fast policy response. And one could argue maybe a better policy response than other uh, continents. Um, you know, the lockdowns uh, that we saw, uh, you know, in, in uh, I was in France at the time and we were on lockdown, quite severe lockdown, uh, many other countries had similar lockdowns. Well, you know, uh, uh, many African countries uh, adopted very quickly similar policies. Uh, Africa also had experience with contract tracing from their uh, exposures to Ebola. Uh, some have argued that there was very high levels of cooperation among countries through in particular the Africa CDC, uh, very high compliance uh, with mask wearing among the population. And so it could very well be that uh, this, you know, this is the true reason why the continent has been doing so well. There's just one puzzle then that we can throw uh, to this uh, is the fact that Tanzania uh, seems to have been doing quite well as well in terms of, uh, you know, few deaths. And yet it seems like this is a, con a, con a country where the leadership did not fully embrace, uh, you know, this type of uh, rapid response. And so uh, these are all questions that I have that I, uh, I'm sure Professor Abinagwa will be able to uh, uh, answer and, and discuss. Um, but the, the, uh, the, this, this good news in terms of the health uh, effects uh, is somewhat counterbalanced by potentially bad news, which is that even though there is not that many COVID cases, uh, it seems like COVID disrupted everything nevertheless. And what this graph shows you is using the Google mobility data, it just shows you that you know, right around the end of March, uh, throughout the sub uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and I showed you the different uh, sections of the continent in different colors, uh, there was a massive drop in, in, in mobility. This is measured as like how many people are like passing through, you know, bus stations and things like that. Um, and I, I put South Africa separately since it was affected so much more. And you see that it had a very strict uh, you know, uh, lockdown. Um, and, and up to this day, in most of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have not gone back to the normal level. You see, we're not yet back at zero, okay? And this is all the more uh, you know, striking that this happened essentially at the same time as uh, in other countries. So the France here, I added France in some French, uh, is a blue line. So France you know, in, introduced a lockdown maybe a little bit earlier than everyone uh, on this graph. And then the US is the orange line. That, uh, you know, the US actually did not do as strict a lockdown as you know, it was very heterogeneous across states. And so many countries in Africa did you know, an even more severe uh, reaction than, uh, than, than the US, even though you know, they had essentially you know, very, very few cases at the time. So there's this very rapid reaction 
uh, you know, very early on, which could have led to stemming the disease. But then, uh, you know, obviously it had uh, economic impacts that uh, we will hear from, um, uh, especially from, from Albert. And then this you know, may lead to other ways through which a disease could have been deadly. Um, you know, some have argued that this may have stemmed a lot of efforts uh, in terms of uh, preventing other disease, uh, diseases to spread. Uh, maybe the efforts towards uh, you know, dealing with HIV, yes, TB, malaria, multinimalization have been stalled because of the restrictions on, 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 uh, on activities. Obviously, lots of income, increase in food insecurity. A lot of kids are out of school. Uh, you know, schools have been closed in most of the continent. Uh, there's like a number of, of, of issues there. It's much harder to do remote learning uh, if many people are not connected uh, through um, you know, the internet. Uh, in some countries, they've gone all in and, and decided that the year was canceled. So, so Kenya canceled the 2020 school year. Uh, Ghana decided to push off uh, the start of the school year to, uh, to, 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 to January instead of September. And so there may be consequences on the new, new next generation that will be long lasting uh, if, if it's not uh, possible to, to remedy that. And so these are important things to think about. Obviously, the economic slowdown worldwide, uh, decline in export prices is going to hit Africa uh, and the global uh, recession. So these are, you know, a lot of the questions that I hope we'll explore in the panel and what explains uh, Africa's relative success in averting uh, COVID-19 death. What do we know about the magnitude of the human and economic uh, impacts that I just described uh, from the, you know, uh, you know, measure that had to be taken? Uh, and importantly, what does the road to discovery look like? Um, and what role for global institutions like the WHO, like the World Bank, what do we know from uh, previous uh, epidemics that can be useful? So uh, with, uh, with that said, uh, I'm gonna start with our panel and we are gonna start with uh, Professor uh, Agnes Binaguao. For those of you who joined us uh, late, let me just uh, remind you, she is a pediatrician in training, currently the Vice Chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity uh, and uh, former, uh, former sorry, Minister of Health uh, in Rwanda. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Professor Binangwa, the floor is yours. Thank you again so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me and good evening. It's night here in Rwanda. So thank you for your introduction and uh, uh, for um, what you have presented for Rwanda. My main objective will be to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on health outcome. In, in health system in Sub-Saharan Africa compare, but I will compare also to the US and to uh, Europe and also talk about the contributors to the pandemic response in Africa. The, this second slide uh, shows you first what is the status of COVID-19 cases in Africa compared to Europe. You can see that the Africa is on the top, the, uh, the, the green on the top of all those curves. And you can see that uh, Africa has very little ca uh, cases compared to the other continent. Same for that. You can see on top here in orange uh, that uh, the contribution of Africa is the smallest. Uh, if we compare also the number of deaths uh, to the number of cases, it shows that Africa is also doing better so far. This rate for Africa uh, is 2% for North America, 4% and 6% for Europe. And see for my country Rwanda in the top, the bottom, in the bottom. And I want to insist that you see Rwanda, you see South Africa, so that for the general population, I don't, I, I don't talk about you, but for the general population, uh, and even the general family of researchers, they, Africa is one uh, box and uh, they don't make the difference between countries, South Africa or Rwanda, uh, like they do for, between Italy and Norway. Uh, it, there is a big impact on uh, the health system in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's across the world. You can see here uh, the photos of uh, in, in uh, down left, uh, Italy in, um, top right, uh, New York, and uh, you can see uh, Rwanda on the top left and South Africa down. I just put those photos to just illustrate the impact and how all health systems across the world were overwhelmed. Uh, the impact of health workers is also huge due to compromised safety, but it's also across the world. We have 10,000 health workers infected in Africa at the end of July. One 
160,000 in the US as of yesterday, and in Europe, 150,000 in only nine countries early July. So this stretch is across the world. Uh, worldwide, there is also a disruption of care. You can even see 90% uh, of countries reporting a disruption in services. And uh, you can, uh, you, you have in, uh, in um, England, uh, they say that uh, the postponement of some cancer care will lead to 18,000 deaths. Uh, increase of disparities that were pre-existing, yes. Uh, vaccination and delivery for the poorest, uh, uh, it's, it's a fact. Health system and health workers worldwide were disrupted. There is a shortage of PPE in the US, Europe, and in Africa. But I have to put, to put a point of ethic here. The vulnerable country have been seeing their procurement uh, goods stolen by powerful countries. And CDC Africa has tried to do a pool procurement with success, but mitigate by the fact that even when they had money, the procurement order were not considered even if it was posed before the rich countries. Uh, there is a disruption in healthcare services, as I said. Uh, there, there is an increase of inequities worldwide. And in Africa, we, we, we need to do more studies to know what happened to our minorities, we don't know. In other countries, like in the US, we know that black people do um, uh, make uh, comprise 13% of the population and do 30% uh, and do 30% of COVID. So it's there is a disproportionate uh, impact on the black population. We have an issue for me with all what you say, uh, all what I read of the Western supremacy mentality when it's uh, compared to uh, they talk about Africa. The reason of all African has blocked their border, do the social distancing, order the mask, except Tanzania, I agree, but it's one country out of how many. And uh, as you say, we have met the continent with the, the, uh, the biggest number of countries. Uh, it was expected that we will have 10 million deaths and uh, the Global Health Security Index was saying we are a failed uh, continent, we will be wiped out uh, with something like COVID. And the US was, um, marked as the, the most prepared. So they were to totally wrong. We need new uh, metrics and a new way to analyze uh, countries. Uh, there is deny, but I want to say that it is in Tanzania or the US, there is a good studies that show that when elections are in the horizon, the behavior against the pandemic, because we need people out to go and vote and campaigning are different. There is also the sort the North-South paradigm where solution have to come from the North. The South cannot do better than the North and a refusal to learn from uh, the South. For Rwanda, I'm going to give the country I know the best. So we learn our contextual factor, transport across country, no running water everywhere, the spread of the disease and financial instability. But we had facilitated in Rwanda, strong national leadership, a culture of accountability, access to internet and like mobile money. And we apply immediately, the day we had the first case, the 14th of March, even before, sorry, two months before, when China uh, uh, created the alarm and the, 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 the outbreak spread in uh, surrounding uh, countries, uh, washing hands before taking buses or going in public area, testing, contract tracing, quarantine, isolation, lockdown, border closing, social distancing, but also focus on truth and cultivate the trust for the population to follow you. And implementation strategies for those evidence-based uh, intervention is the use of data, reading every day what happened new in uh, worldwide and integrating policies and guidelines by education, the health providers and the population, control the border, continue to control the border and, uh, uh, and also a multi-sectorial coordination, a government that works as one immigration, police, local government, education, and health work together, and maintain a focus on primary care. Also promote innovation, drones, robots, to, to decrease the movement 
and uh, increase services. Accountability, local leaders at the head of village have to be sure that nobody in their village are starving because of the lockdown. When the lockdown was there or because of the decreasing of capacity to uh, uh, generate money. Uh, strength the health sector and focus on equity, provide food, free testing, quarantine, free treat treatment. It was for all, except for people who just have to test because they want to travel. For the rest, it's free. Doing so, people are, are um, uh, really abide to uh, the guiding principle and provide financial support. I want to see the next slide because uh, Rwanda is showing a promising health system coverage before COVID. And you can see that during COVID, the, the delivery in health facilities didn't change. The use of family planning didn't change. So that means uh, th this is for the organization we have uh, because COVID centers are not mixed with the ordinary hospitals. And when somebody is sick, you, you just have a, call, a phone call uh, they come to take you with an ambulance, bring you to do the test and hospitalize you in COVID center so that you don't risk to spread the infection inside the hospital. Moving forward, we have to continue what to do, but track emerging contextual factors that we don't know and be flexible enough to prepare for any scenario and continue to support the vulnerable. We need also to build partnership inside Africa, but also with the North and the West, but more um, uh, respectful partnership. And there are great initiative in that. And also stop politicize uh, the disease and just go for science. Uh, we face some challenges in African countries, as you have seen, economic threat for ordinary, ordi ordinary uh, for formal work sectors and also for informal sectors. Uh, we, we are going to, to have an economy uh, contracting with 7% uh, in Africa. But I have read yesterday that the US is about uh, 30. Europe is planned for 11. So it's countrywide, uh, sorry, it's worldwide. And we may face difficulties to continue uh, contract, uh, contact tracing and, and, and also the limited uh, research capacity for Africa. So this is what I want to share with you and for the uh, the discussion and um, can wait to join you. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for all these insights. Um, I know your, your slides are in high demand. A number of uh, folks in the Q&A have asked uh, for those. So hopefully you'll be sharing, uh, willing to share that, uh, a lot of information. Uh, thank you. We'll, we'll uh, now move on uh, to um, more of the economic <coughs> impacts and uh, uh, Dr. Zoifak from the World Bank, uh, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dupas. Um, you know, it's a pleasure to speak at this conference on the impact of COVID on uh, African economies. Uh, this presentation is on uh, economic impact of COVID-19 and policy responses in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I would start by uh, referring to two uh, publications uh, from which we draw uh, heavily. Uh, the first is the uh, World Bank Africa's Pulse, which is our macroeconomic monitoring, uh, the one we published in April, where we actually did the first comprehensive assessment of uh, the impact of COVID on African economies. And I want to highlight that when I say Africa in this presentation is Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, which are the 48 of the 54 countries uh, Pascaline has shown earlier. So uh, in this report, we uh, definitely use different models to uh, come to an assessment of that economic impact that I will share with you. The second publication is uh, uh, you know, a chapter that I've just contributed with my colleagues, uh, Calvin, Jofak, and uh, Asan Dudu uh, in, in a book uh, that has just been published on assessing the economic impact of COVID-19 uh, uh, in the world, so um, in the developing world. So uh, these are the references. Now, let me uh, start, uh, you know, by saying uh, I'm extremely happy uh, to see uh, the positive tone this discussion is taking, 
Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we need to uh, celebrate the fact that the very, very pessimistic uh, projections did not materialize in terms of uh, number of cases and, and death rate. But it's not over yet. It's not over yet. And, uh, you know, when we look at the numbers, you can see this chart, which is September 1st, at September 1st, we can see uh, the number of cases recorded starting to plateau in most of the African countries. And to actually have an idea of how this is a big progress, you should see what they were in June, right? And, and you could see that, uh, you know, upward trend. And, and I'm glad to see them plateauing now in, in, in Africa. But it's not done yet because we actually haven't started really uh, observing a declining rate in a, in a significant number of African countries. Uh, the number of, uh, you know, uh, cases is stabilizing, but, but what is actually quite important to notice is, um, you know, mobility numbers are actually ahead of the curve. While we're not seeing a steep decline yet, we're actually seeing a pickup in mobility data across Africa that is actually uh, uh, letting some uh, specialists, uh, including the CDC, to uh, caution about a potential second wave. So it's important to acknowledge that, you know, so far so good, great, but let's not uh, let our guard down. We should continue wearing uh, masks. We should continue those protective measures and all you know, they use the, all the PPE that we can afford uh, to make sure we, we then get to a stage where these numbers go down. So um, let me leave you with a couple of uh, key messages. You know, and I'm, you know, the first one, uh, I just, just talk about it. The second one is that uh, while the uh, mortality rate and the uh, contamination rate may not be, uh, you know, as impactful as we had feared, the economic impact of COVID on Africa is going to be huge. Nevertheless, we are uh, projecting that Sub-Saharan Africa would enter its first recession, full recession in 25 years. And, uh, you know, GDP growth is projected to decline, you know, from 2.4% in 2019 to a range of minus two to minus 5%. And I want to stop on this range because what we, when we did our projections, we, we decided to, uh, given all the uncertainty, to actually give a range. And when we published our projections in April, we were the most pessimistic numbers uh, across all institutions. And by the way, even the IMF had a number that was more positive than ours, which was quite strange in Washington. But um, uh, uh, since then, most institutions have actually revised their projections downwards, and most institutions are now in that window of minus two to minus five. This, our projections date back to April, and we haven't changed that since. Um, and it's extremely important to uh, notice that it's not just about GDP that will be affected. What we'll see is that, um, you know, number of African countries would have a severe shock on uh, household welfare. Poverty will increase. Millions more people will be pushed into absolute poverty in Africa as, it, as the result of uh, COVID-19 as our economies uh, collectively lose between uh, 37 and, and $80 billion in output in 2020. So um, what is even more severe in our, you know, in our assessment is that we are facing a triple crisis in Africa. The health crisis that uh, the previous speaker discussed extensively, translating into an economic crisis, but the third potential crisis, which is you know, really becoming uh, obvious by the day, is a potential food crisis. And that has been exacerbated by a collapse in import. And when you realize Africa as a subcontinent actually imports more than $40 billion of food every year, the 
sudden stop in global trade has definitely led to a real increase in risk of food security. So uh, these are extremely important impacts of this economic crisis and the potential health crisis. Now, a potential food crisis. Now, there's another uh, aspect of it, which is what is happening to the private sector in Africa. I'll come back to that in, in, the, in, my, in, my, in my presentation. Um, because you know, we need to make sure we do not allow our already fragile economies to collapse because entering the crisis, most of our economies were already uh, you know, uh, underperforming. As some of you may know, three economies in Sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria, South Africa, and Angola make up 60% of our GDP, which means basically countries like Rwanda, Ethiopia, uh, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, who have been growing extremely fast, do not uh, cannot actually pull that average up. And our three largest economies have been actually underperforming even before COVID hit. So it's gonna be a uh, prolonged crisis as we see it. We don't see this as being a sharp V recovery. Uh, you know, uh, uh, growth rate may probably come back uh, faster next year, but the uh, impact on real output will take a couple of years before we are back to where we are we were in 2019. So this is very important. Now, in terms of policy response, what has happened is uh, we have observed, despite the delay and the late arrival of COVID on the continent, we have observed a kind of copycat approach in a number of African countries. That was the case for policies. It was also the case for reopening. And a number of African countries have actually reopened just because Europe reopened. So, and we have actually been arguing, arguing that we need a differentiated policy response in Africa to reflect the uh, peculiarity of African economy structure. And one of that peculiarity is informality. And that's the reason why a uh, you know, number of African countries could not implement a strict lockdown. Absolutely impossible, given the fact that most people in the informal sector leave, you know, from hand to mouth, and it wouldn't have been realistic actually to do to make it happen, and 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 that is certainly uh, you know one thing that we're continuing to uh, emphasize as countries struggle to uh, reopen. Uh, it is important to adopt a differentiated approach uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 reopening. Um, one extremely important aspect is uh, the fiscal side. The crisis hit and with it, uh, we had a collapse in commodity prices. Most African countries had budgeted oil, for example, at around $58 per barrel. And by April, the barrel was below $30. That's basically uh, like, you know, you are in a crisis and your salary get uh, divided by two and you still have to face all those challenges. So this, this has been extremely difficult for African countries. And, um, and because of that, there were no buffers left and the fiscal space is just so uh, reduced that African countries would need huge support from the rest of the world. And that support should come through debt relief. The uh, you know, IMF and World Bank have been working with the G20 to uh, you know, implement a debt standstill, standstill initiative where you know, interest payments uh, on debt would be forgiven for a certain period of time, therefore creating that space for countries to actually um, um, uh, you know, face the, uh, the emergency crisis. World Bank and other institutions have been uh, stepping in to provide support um, um, and, and you know, emergency projects in health and other sectors, uh, human development sectors, critical. And that's essential because most of uh, the loss in, in, in gains would come from uh, you know, permanent losses in human capital as fewer kids go back to school or the quality of education 
already quite poor may deteriorate further. So all these are essential uh, uh, you know, findings of our, the two reports that I've mentioned to you. I wouldn't bore you with uh, the details, the technical details of our uh, you know, general equilibrium uh, model, but I'll just you know, stop uh, on, on, on a couple of slides to illustrate what I just said. If you look at this chart, the impact of COVID on in in uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa would be uh, the highest in countries that are metal and mineral resource rich, and oil rich countries would also be the most affected because of that shock on commodities, as I that I mentioned. If you uh, think of the impacts as to why that impact is going to be so severe. Um, you know, what we see is that, you know, most of the growth drivers would be impacted. Uh, consumption uh, had, you know, will be, uh, you know, uh, seriously uh, reduced, investment uh, would collapse, and even more in what we call here the catastrophic scenario is actually one that soon may reveal to be the normal, normal scenario, whereby the crisis may last throughout 2020. Right, you know, the optimistic scenario was by July we would actually be over it. Obviously, it's not going to happen. It's, you know, so um, what what you see uh, on this chart is basically, and these are the results of that uh, uh, general equilibrium modeling, uh, the impact on household welfare it's going to be significant. And what you have here in this. Um, um, you know, what you have in this uh, second chart is a third scenario that we have actually included, which is the non-cooperative scenario. The non-cooperative scenario is the catastrophic scenario plus a border closing, basically shutting down trade within African countries. And that leads to the worst impact on growth and household welfare. This has actually led us to suggest to countries in our policy you know, discussion that we treat trade and trade related workers as essential workers instead of, you know, just locking down borders because non-cooperation would actually be the most damaging to, 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 to African, you know, countries. Now, let me just, you know, share with you. Yes. Sorry, Albert, we need you to, to we need to make sure we have time for. Um, Very good. So. Okay, uh, one minute to close here, uh, uh, you know, just sharing with you the approach the World Bank has taken to advise countries uh, in this crisis. And it has been three, uh, three prong approach. One, focusing on the health situation, preserving lives. Second, on preserving livelihoods. And third, preserving the future, basically supporting firms in the second pillar. And in the third, sowing the seeds for recovery. And early lessons from this crisis to conclude, uh, the first is the digital is not a luxury for Africa. Coming into COVID, few uh, development experts were still wondering if the digital is not too expensive or too uh, such a luxury good for Africa, clearly not. Second, uh, global value chains are in question. Integrating global value chain has been the driver of growth for most developing countries in the past 50 years. We need to reinterrogate those uh, and, and start thinking or focusing on region building and really intensifying regional value chains in Africa. Third is the heavy dependence on food imports. Um, you know, we clearly have the potential in Africa not only to feed ourselves, but to feed the world. But agricultural productivity has remained one of the lowest in the world and has remained that low for the past 40 years. Something has to be done there. And, you know, last point I would probably want to end on is <clears throat> this notion that education and health are social sectors is one I've been really pushing back on. What is social about human capital? It is about investment, it's about productivity, it's about growth. So uh, it is time, really about time that our governments in Africa really put enough emphasis in investing in human capital 
not as a social sector, but as a driver of future growth. Last but not least, let's uh, think twice when we borrow, because we have been borrowing with a lot of sorrow as this crisis has established that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll ask you to stop sharing your slides and then we'll move on uh, to our third panelist, uh, Professor Archibong from Columbia University. Um, thank you very much, Pascaline. I'm just going to provide some, some lessons from past uh, epidemics. I, I, as Pascaline mentioned earlier, my work is on the economics of epidemics, part of my research. Uh, and, and what we kind of learn is that there, there, are three, there are three key points that come out of thinking about the success cases in Africa, right? So, so the, the, how have African countries that have had this history of dealing with epidemics, how have they dealt with them successfully in the past? And what are some lessons that we can learn? So one, I'm gonna talk about health financing, and this is key. Uh, and, and thinking about, you know, the, you know, Albert mentioned the, the kind of like, the role of external spending and donor spending in health is, is somewhat outsized in Africa. And I'll, I'll show you some statistics on that. Two, thinking about domestic governance and response. So now I think everybody is, is very familiar with this lingo on, on contact tracing, testing, and supported isolation. So you know, Africa, many African countries have, have been very successful in implementing these things for years. Uh, and three, about building trust. So a, a lot of you know, the kind of response to, to epidemics and, and, and trying to prevent future disease outbreaks has to do with you know, making sure people take up vaccination making sure that people trust in their government institutions enough to take up vaccination. So I'll, I'll show you some evidence from uh, research that we've done on these things. So just to kind of start out on the health financing. So this is the picture of health financing by region, um, the most recent data from 2017 from the World Bank. Uh, if you look at kind of across a number of categories, so go, uh, government spending on health as a percentage of GDP, in Africa it's about 5%, very similar to Asia, South Asia, but lower than the, the world average of about 7%. Uh, same thing with government spending on health, it's really low compared to the rest of the world. So in Africa, again, it's about 7% uh, compared to, so similar to South Asia, lower than the rest of the world, which is around 10%, and lower than the Latin American uh, and Caribbean average of about 12%. Uh, when you look at out-of-pocket out of spending, people are spending much more uh, in terms of like out-of-pocket expenses on health as a percentage of total health spending, in Africa, it's something like you know, almost 40% compared to the rest of the world, which is about 19%. So if you look at like compare Africa, and this is the you know, entire African continent, it compared very similarly to kind of South Asian countries on, on everything except this out-of-pocket spending. Uh, but, but kind of one category stands out, and this is the share of donor spending in uh, total health spending in African countries, right? So this is African countries. So health spending, uh, external, health spending, so donor spending on health as a percentage of total health spending is about 20% in Africa compared to what, like 0.2% in the, in the world. And, and just like much higher than any other region, South Asia, Latin America, and Caribbean. So this has real implications for then when it comes to kind of epidemic response. And specifically, you know, this kind of slightly motivated our research. We've been doing this work on meningitis epidemics for years. Uh, and, and meningitis is, is one of these diseases, infection of the lining of the brain. It's really nasty, you know, death, pain, disability. Uh, and, and it's one of these diseases that affects about 23 countries in, in the African meningitis belt. They are frequently exposed to these epidemics. So, so a lot of countries kind of have experience dealing with this. So we, were, we wanted to understand like, what is the, the implication of that chart I just showed you? That you have such a high share of, of health spending, right? 20% coming from external sources. How does that then affect how kind of the role of global governance institutions like the WHO or the World Bank in helping to mitigate response to epidemics. So what we did was to say, like, let's examine epidemics in this meningitis belt in 23 countries from Senegal to Ethiopia, um, 700 million people frequently exposed to epidemics. And let's see what happens when you have, you know, these like sudden high exposure to disease, to meningitis. Uh, and, you know, your the kind of national level doesn't rise to epidemic levels. So the way it works is that the WHO declares an epidemic only if the national level of cases rises to 100 per 100,000 population. So think of it like you as a district within Nigeria, for instance, right, where I'm from, can be experiencing super high levels of disease, like unexpected high levels of meningitis. However, nationally, the level does not rise to epidemic levels. So as defined by the WHO, so they don't declare an epidemic. So what happens is that if you have these like high unexpected levels of disease 
And the WHO does not declare an epidemic year because you don't rise that national 100 cases per 100,000 population. You see these huge declines in economic activity. So think of this as per capita, like per capita GDP. Uh, you see huge declines in, in kind of child health outcomes. So there are more stunted children, this is this dark bar, and, and more underweight children as well, right? When the, you know, if your national level kind of rises to epidemic levels as defined by the WHO, really, really surprising reversal of the effects, right? So in those cases where you have this high burden of disease, but in that year, the WHO declared an epidemic year, basically everything switches, right? So in these areas now, you actually see an increase in economic activity. You see uh, an increase in child health outcomes. You have, you have like, you know, less stunted children. This is the light blue bar. Um, and you have less underweight children. We do see effects. So Pascaline mentioned this at the beginning. We see some effects which are kind of worrying on, on crowd out of routine vaccination. So like the, the kind of child vaccinations around tuberculosis and, and measles and diphtheria, like DPT that you usually get in those years that are declared epidemic years, you actually see a decline in total vaccinations to children. So, so very kind of interesting switching effects when you have this like WHO declares an epidemic year um, in, in your country. Why is this happening? So one of the things that we are able to highlight as, as maybe like a, one of the mechanisms that might be driving this is that, remember that external financing chart I showed you, right? 20% is a high number. A lot of African countries are, are kind of getting a, a significant share of health spending from these external spending sources, like donor spending, if you will. So what happens when the WHO declares an epidemic year is that you actually, it triggers an inflow of, of, of kind of disaster aid, right? So we can document this with World Bank projects. Um, and I was talking to Albert about this earlier, but you know, this is the kind of data that we have on, on, on uh, World Bank projects. And you actually see kind of an increase in, in the amount of money, uh, dollars committed to health projects and disbursed to health projects. And also the, just the share of health projects funded um, during epidemic years. So this kind of influx and think of like stimulus money, is like really, really important for reversing these negative effects of epidemics. And just to show you, these are kind of like the type of programs that get funded. Um, you know, this is World Bank uh, project titles and you see during epidemic years, you have this economic recovery and adjustment credit is a top title uh, and health sector programs versus in a non-epidemic year, the typical health project would be like a fertility nutrition uh, health project and, and community action program, something like that. So really, you know, highlighting that this, this is like what's a, sig a significant part, right? Of the story, this kind of influx of donor spending from places like the, the World Bank or, or kind of external funding sources to help. Okay, so the kind of second part I'm gonna talk about in terms of the key points, well, we have time, um, very briefly, is thinking about, again, we, we, uh, you know, Agnes talked about this earlier, really, really important domestic governance has been very, very key in managing the effects of these epidemics. And I can speak, I'm, you know, I can speak from the point of Nigeria. Um, the Nigeria CDC has, um, you know, did this with Ebola very successfully, has done this with COVID very successfully, implemented contact tracing and information. They've been using a lot of technology. So they're like COVID-19 tracker apps, WhatsApp chat boxes. Um, testing is low, but that's something that they've been trying to kind of increase again, based on their experiences with past epidemics and, and really supported isolation. So Albert mentioned the, the large informal sector, ensuring that you have like food aid, free water and electricity for the very poor investment in sanitation. Countries like Nigeria and Ghana have implemented these policies that have been very, very key in managing past epidemics and also COVID. Last point on the trust. Really, really important, right? So I don't know if you guys heard about this in the news. This is there were some protests in South Africa about like we will not be we, we will not we are not guinea pigs. We're not going to take up these COVID nineteen vaccination uh, kind of trials. And people's mistrust is is very well based, right? There's a, there's been a history of kind of mismanagement and, and and kind of unethical behavior by some companies when it comes to vaccination trials in Africa. And the kind of infamous one in Nigeria is the nineteen ninety six Pfizer. Uh, meningitis epidemic trials, which like killed a lot of children in northern Nigeria uh, and, and led to like real protests in the streets, right? So, so how did government handle that? They really, really made sure to involve local stakeholders, so traditional leaders um, and religious leaders that people trusted to say, spread information about the vaccines that we're giving to your children and say like, we will guarantee that these are not going to, to be, you know, harmful to your children. And really building that trust was very, very important in, in kind of getting people to, to take up vaccination you know, after the kind of news about the Pfizer trials came out in 2000 in Nigeria. So I will stop there, but, but you know, just kind of these three key points. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, so we'll uh, now go on uh, with, with the Q and A, and there are a number of questions in the in the Q and A box that I will um, I will I will relay. So a number of questions from uh, a few uh, people, uh, Natalie, Hannah, Alistair, were um, kind of like uh, pushing back against my provocative uh, slide, saying that Africa had beat COVID, and uh, arguing that maybe you know it's just uh, not so clear that uh, there are no uh, I mean few cases. Maybe it's really due to lack of testing uh, under counting. And so the question is really whether uh, there will be other manifestation of the crisis in a form of like extra uh, deaths that are not being seen, uh, but are likely uh, to be happening uh, in remote areas in villages. Um, so is there any, uh, any sense that uh, there is more of a crisis than what can be seen? Uh, my, my own uh, experience from uh, being, uh, being doing phone surveys with various communities around the continent is that people do not report um, you know, excess deaths around them, but maybe the numbers are too small to be picked up in such. So I'm curious to see, uh, Professor Binagua, what, uh, what your response is. I think in you, you, you were provocative saying that you, we beat COVID. Nobody say that. And even me, I say going forward, we need to be careful. But uh, the systematic questioning about, is it true because it's Africa, go in my Western uh, narrative. And all the black people who are saying that are just colonizing their brain. Uh, we don't see more death in hospital. We don't see more death in communities. People doesn't die anonymous, anonymously. Did you see what has happened to New York? You believe we can hide that? No. Huh? So, uh, I, 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 that's my answer. That means we have less cases. The cases we have are uh, led less to death. Better do studies and try to see why. Let us do behavioral studies and implementation uh, uh, type of studies and try to see what the world can extract from that. Thank you. Um, uh, a number of uh, questions also were around um, the informal sector. Um, Dr. Zoifa, can you tell us a little bit more about what you know of the impact of the crisis on the informal sector? I know the World Bank has been doing a lot of surveys. I've seen uh, impressive, uh, you know, very rapid data coming out of these studies showing like the decline in, in income that uh, people have uh, experienced in, in response to the lockdown. Do you, do you have um, some, some magnitude that you can share with us? Uh, beyond those you had in your slides? Yes, uh, let me quickly come back on that uh, first question on uh, you know, uh, beating the, uh, the odds. I think it's important, as Agnes said, to acknowledge that you know, uh, you know, it's not over yet. We are still, we need to continue be, uh, you know, to, to be cautious. Um, but it's also important to uh, push back on, on, you know, on this constant questioning as if um, for some Africa can not do something right. And I think that's, that's something you know, that you see in a certain press. And, and uh, it's important to also acknowledge when African countries do things right and achieve to, uh, to, to say it. So um, I, think, I think that's, that's extremely important. On the impact on, on the informal sector, um, the first thing to realize is COVID was an urban, crisis first. And most of our informal sector is in urban areas. So most of the collapse in consumption that we see in our modeling and the, uh, the, the findings I show is actually coming from those uh, distanciation measures or uh, those uh, you know, lockdown for countries that implemented them. Uh, that led to uh, a, a significant reduction in interaction between people which is the essence of the informal sector activities. So it was extremely important. Second thing, uh, we've been using high frequency surveys to document impact on uh, informal uh, firms in Africa. And my office uh, has been looking at especially uh, impact on women in the informal sector. And we are clearly seeing uh, that the number of closure of informal activities has increased significantly during COVID, but that women-led uh, you know, uh, activities, women-led firms in the informal sector are actually being affected more or affected disproportionately. So uh, these, are, these are worrying uh, uh, numbers, but we are continuing to collect those data. And it's important to 
also say uh, the crisis is an opportunity and the opportunity for uh, African countries to really um, shift from the traditional or classical way of collecting data to embracing and leveraging the digital. And that's what we're trying to do to uh, assess those impacts. So short answer, the impact on the informal sector was extremely uh, uh, negative. And uh, we hope as countries re reopen that it would uh, you know, improve. Thanks. I wonder whether uh, part of the greater effect on women is the fact that many schools are closed and so children have to be you know, taken care of uh, and that may disproportionately affect women. Um, you know, uh, uh, I guess uh, we, are, we don't have a lot of time left, but there, uh, there was a, a question about uh, the likely impact of the crisis on flows of foreign aid. And so I was wondering whether uh, Professor Archibon, you could speak to that, uh, given what you've shown us of the, you know, the fact that it can really help uh, deal with crisis. When the crisis is global, uh, what should we expect? It's a good question. I mean, this is like we're in uncharted territory. Uh, and I guess, Albert, I don't know if you, you can also, you've been following this and you can jump in on this. Uh, from, from our experience in our research, what we see is that you do see more inflow of kind of health aid, um, but then you see less to non-health projects, right? So it's, it's kind of a, there's a trade-off going on where you see an increase in health, health kind of health funding, health aid, uh, but less to health, non-health aid. So kind of the aggregate effect is, is like flat. Um, what's gonna happen now and, and how do we think about uh, kind of, donor aid and, and foreign aid in a pandemic or in a yeah in a kind of when you have this as, as a global event um we're, we're gonna have to see um i know like i've been following the world bank there was a huge announcement about like stimulus uh and funding to african countries that it's like a really really huge uh, amount that came out i think a few months ago so i think the aid is still happening you know a lot of international organizations are still kind of funneling aid to these to these uh, to these regions uh, and again, it's just like especially important for Africa because of the fact that, I mean, we are 20% of our, of our health spending is coming from external sources. Mm -hmm. The world average is 0.2%. So, you know, these, these funding sources are going to be very, very important um, for, for kind of dealing with the, the, the effects of the pandemic. Thank you. Um, there was another question which I think is very important. I want to make sure we have time for it. It was uh, related to uh, your point, Professor Binagua, that there is competition for procurement and supplies. And so uh, one respondent was, uh, one uh, sorry, audience member was asking, um, you know, what should we expect when a vaccine is available? What are going to be the ethics of, uh, you know, uh, thinking about who is going to get access to the vaccine first? And you know, are you worried that when there is a vaccine, uh, it's going to be difficult for countries in Africa to get uh, to get their, their their fair share of the supply? That's a reality. Uh, we don't expect the people to be better during a pandemic than in usual time. Uh, what happened when, why I uh, noticed that, uh, take a country, I'm even not going to take a country, I'm going to take Barbados, where the minister complained officially against the US to stolen on the tarmac, the, 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 the respirator, procured and paid already. And, and it's all over that uh, France did that also uh, against the US. So I think what we need to recognize here, we need to go to new international laws that are make the, the, the poorful countries to have more ethical behavior. Uh, for the vaccine, I believe that the country that will do uh, discover a vaccine will serve their people first. But what I know also is that there is a lot of money given by people like Bill Gates. We have Gavi that is involved. We have a lot of entities that say that they will uh, privilege first the people at risk. That means the healthcare providers across the world. So I believe that this is already a progress and it's the first time the world will have to have such a plan uh, where the international organization and the big fish, the big donors are in uh, around the table to make that ethical. If not, it's going to be the jungle and we know that uh, we don't have laws to protect uh, the people. Next, first thing after the pandemic. All right, well, um, can, I, can I just add something on that answer? Yeah. Which, is, which is procurement is important, but we should also, as African countries, seize this opportunity to start producing some of those goods. 
And that's what Ethiopia is doing, shifting its manufacturing structure that was producing, you know, jeans and suits for the US market, converting that into production of PPE and exporting to other African countries. That's an opportunity. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you so much. We are, um, we are out of time. Um, there were a number of questions that we didn't have time to address. Uh, sorry about that. We'll keep, uh, we'll keep a note of them and then try to um, uh, send re references or resources uh, to address them. Um, before uh, we close, I just wanted to uh, mention the next, uh, uh, I'm not the next, but one of the upcoming events that we have at the King Center is going to be uh, a conversation with David Miliband, the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee uh, on Thursday, October 29 uh, at noon. Uh, you can register for this event on our website. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, the, and especially our panelists. It was absolutely wonderful to have you and to uh, hearing uh, your, your views. Um, it's been uh, really uh, insightful um, and uh, many more uh, questions uh, have been raised from uh, hearing you. So uh, we hope uh, we have a chance to hear from you again uh, and that uh, uh, my um, forecast <laughs> that Africa will beat COVID uh, will turn out to be right uh, sooner uh, than later. Thank you everybody um, and uh, be well.